Metabolism is the very foundation of all of our health. It is the foundational, most important level of our bodies and our biology and our health. And the reason it's so foundational is because we are this incredible machine of 40 trillion plus cells. And all those cells are doing literally trillions of chemical reactions all day long. And our lives are really just the bubbling up of all those chemical reactions happening all the time. And all of those chemical reactions need to be basically paid for with energy. And that's what our metabolism creates. So it's it's the base of the pyramid of all other functions in the body. So if we don't get that right, really nothing can go right. Dr. Casey Means is a Stanford-trained physician and co-founder of Levels, a health technology company with the mission of reversing the world's metabolic health crisis. She received her BA with honors and her MD from Stanford, was president of her Stanford class, and has served on Stanford faculty. She trained in head and neck surgery before leaving traditional medicine to devote her life to tackling the root cause of why Americans are sick. She has been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, Forbes, Women's Health, and more. In this conversation, Dr. Means powerfully explains how we can use metabolic health tools and strategies to support our own health and that of our children and families. Dr. Casey Means. It's Kelly, it's so good to see you. (laughs) Finally here, good energy. I'm so excited about this book. We've been talking about it forever. We align so much on metabolic health, blood sugar balance, and the basics. And you're here today to break that down for everyone and to remind my audience about the importance of mitochondrial health and blood sugar balance and give us the keys to creating good energy. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you. You have been such an inspiration and a guide to me, and I'm so grateful to to be back on your podcast. Thank you. Yeah. Well, so for those people who don't know you, I want them to go back and listen to your first episode after this one. Um, But can you tell the audience who you are and what you do? Absolutely. My name is Casey Means. I am a medical doctor. I trained in head and neck surgery before taking a sharp, sharp right turn away from really the conventional practice of Western medicine, which is so reactive and really focused on managing symptoms and really spending my life and devoting my energy on the real root causes on why we're sick and how to understand our own health, how to really move towards optimal health and thriving and committing my life as a doctor to that, which is very different from how I was trained. Um, In that pursuit, I co-founded a company called Levels Health, which helps people understand their metabolic health with continuous glucose monitors and work to improve it. And I have also written a book called Good Energy, The Surprising Connection Between Metabolism and Limitless Health, which is just a real systems breakdown of why we're getting sicker every single year as Americans, despite increased healthcare spending, what the root of that is, why it's happening, how to understand your foundational health. Um, you know, no doctor necessary how to actually take control and ownership of your own uh, foundational health and then how to improve it. So that's really the mission I'm on is to help people understand uh, their root, uh, you know, the foundations of health, which is rooted in metabolism and how to understand and improve it. Well, that's why I'm so excited to have you on the show because I know we can talk about the unfortunate statistics here in America, when we look at metabolic health, childhood obesity, when we look at type 2 diabetes, no longer being uh, adult onset, but really a problem across the entire nation and, and expanding into the world. But the goal of this podcast is to get people hope. And I think you're so good at explaining how we can have good energy. And so I want, I want to start there. Like, what is energy? What is our metabolism? Can you break those two down for me? Absolutely. So metabolism is the very foundation of all of our health. It is the foundational, most important level of our bodies and our biology and our health. And it's something we really all need to understand. And the reason it's so foundational is because we are this incredible machine of 40 trillion plus cells. And all those cells are doing literally trillions of chemical reactions all day long. And our lives are really just the bubbling up of all those chemical reactions happening all the time. And all of those chemical reactions need to be basically paid for with energy. And that's what our metabolism creates. So it's 
it's the base of the pyramid of all other functions in the body. So if we don't get that right, really nothing can go right. It is the base of everything. And unfortunately, in 93% of American adults, metabolism is not doing great. So the simplest definition of metabolism is how we convert food energy to human energy. And essentially, more conceptually, what that means is how we convert potential energy from the environment, which is essentially food, to active human cellular energy that we can use. So it's a it's a translation of potential energy to real energy we can use. And we take in like over 70 metric tons of food in our lifetime. I can't even imagine what that would look like. It's like a football field or something. And that is this potentiality to power our lives. And we want to convert that super effectively to a currency of energy that can just fuel this incredible life that we want. And right now, that process, that process of food energy to cellular energy, it's literally broken in most of us. And it's broken because the rapidly changing world that we're living in, where over the last 50 to 75 years, pretty much every aspect of our diet, our lifestyle, the way we live, the way we interact with nature, the way we sleep, the way we move, our products, everything is changing so fast because of industrialization and um, you know urbanization and our cells can't keep up. And specifically, the, the rapid changes in our environment are synergistically hurting this precious part of our cell that does that conversion process of food energy to cellular energy, which is the mitochondria. So back to high school biology, the powerhouse of the cell, it does this miraculous, this miraculous process. And pretty much across our food, our sleep habits, our movement habits, our emotional health and stress, our toxins, our relationship with light, even our relationship with temperature, everything changing so fast, it's all hurting the mitochondria. That's what the science is telling us is that the mitochondria are being affected by all these things. And so this is leaving us fundamentally with underpowered bodies, underpowered cells. And of course, like any machine factory city that doesn't have enough power, it's not going to function properly. So the key message is that the pain we're feeling, the suffering we're feeling, the lack of thriving we might be feeling, the chronic diseases we might be facing, our kids, ourselves, our parents, they are linked. And they are linked by a core foundational dysfunction in our bodies that is an underpowering caused by our mitochondria being damaged by our environment. So that's kind of the simple landscape of what is metabolism, where it's happening in the cell, why it's important, and how it's leading to a lot of the issues that we're facing today across symptoms and disease. Okay. So if I'm hearing you correctly, I want to just synthesize this down for the audience. Our metabolism is potential energy converted to energy in our body. And that is what allows us to thrive. And what you're telling me is the powerhouse of our cell, our mitochondria is not producing good energy and it's not producing enough energy. We're underpowered. We're, we have low energy. We have chronic fatigue. We have an inability to deal with the outside environment that's breaking down basically our, our energy system. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. The power system to our body is dysfunctional and you know, of course, that can lead to things like low subjective energy. So like fatigue, like you just mentioned, and feeling tired, which is actually a symptom that leads to some of the, it's like one of the number one reasons that people go to the primary care doctor's office is literally just feeling low energy. So that's certainly a result of this metabolic issue in the body. But What's fascinating is that the spectrum of diseases that can result from this fundamental cellular underpowering and meta- metabolic dysfunction, they're so much broader than just feeling tired or feeling low energy. It can literally almost look like anything. And we know that the metabolic spectrum of disease, when we look at the research, it ranges from depression, anxiety, gout, chronic pain, chronic fatigue, migraine, uh, fibromyalgia. Uh, infertility, PCOS, erectile dysfunction, vision issues, all the way to lethal killers like cancer, heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, even increased risk for dying of things like COVID. It's such a broad spectrum. And I think that gets this idea of, you know, what's so fascinating about the human body is that 
because every single one of our different types of cells needs energy to just foundationally work properly, underpowering, so a problem in this core metabolic process in different types of cells can look like different symptoms. It, you know, In a brain cell, depending on where that's happening, it could look like depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's, dementia, fatigue, what, whatnot. In the ovary, it could look like infertility. And in the liver, it could look like fatty liver disease. And the real blind spot of American medicine, and I would say actually the lethal blind spot of American medicine is that we choose to look at all of these diseases as totally different things because the symptoms look different. And right. what, we're, what we're choosing to do is put on a symptom-based pair of goggles. And what I think you and I and so many others in our space are asking the healthcare system and individuals to do is put on the root cause goggles, put on the metabolic goggles, put on the, um, you know, the sort of cellular physiology goggles. And what you'll see there is that there's actually the same problem happening in cells all over the body that looks like different symptoms, but it's not actually a different thing. And the opportunity here is that if we can fix this fundamental pathway, if we can give more power to our bodies by healing our mitochondria, what you find is that that will help so many different types of symptoms melt away because we're basically restoring power, restoring function to different parts of the body, um, which ultimately will lead to better outcomes. And so that's that's the beauty of this different vision, this different set of goggles for healthcare, is that we actually may be able to do far less to get better outcomes, as opposed to the opposite of what we're doing right now in America, which is that the more we do, the worse the outcomes are getting. So mm -hmm it really shows us that we might not be focusing on the exact right issue. I love that clarity because it makes so much sense to me when you look at the older population, like my parents' age, and you look and you see, oh, well, they're being diagnosed with prediabetes and then all of a sudden they have type 2 diabetes and then they have heart disease and then they have a dementia um, situation or they're not healing properly from like a tooth infection. And you're like, these these are all being treated by totally different physicians based on the issue. You have a neurologist, you have your internist, you have your dentist, and but you're getting to that core, which is we're underpowered. There is no way for these cells to manage the problems when they don't have the energy to deal with it. And when you see th stats like the chances of someone having dementia, it's it, it, the prediction for that is now their insulin levels instead of their age is fascinating because you're, that goes right back to mitochondrial health. So let's simplify this because I think that that gives people hope and they action items. Like how, how do we take care of our mitochondria so we don't have metabolic dysfunction? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that the key thing that I think about is like, we really cut through all the noise of the diet wars and the social media and all the voices. And we just think about like, from the perspective of a cell and the mitochondria, like how do we love it? How do we have compassion for it? How do we think about the incredible amount of work it's th these are doing for us every day and basically be the parents to these trillions of cells and trillion of mitochondria and just think like, what do they need to be able to do the work they need to do? And how do I not overburden them with all these things in the environment that are just going to kind of crush them? And like, I just think really for coming from that place of sort of compassion um, it helps me, you know, do more for my body because they're all, all our cells and all our mitochondria are just sitting there, like waiting to get the inputs they need to then just do the best possible work to give us these beautiful lives. And the challenge for us and the challenge in being in, alive in this time in history is that the world we're living in, the environment, while there are many miraculous, wonderful things, it is it is right now the reality of it is that it's hurting it is hurting our mitochondria and our cells and if we just take the default sort of cultural norms we're going to get sick and our mitochondria are going to get hurt and so our challenge and our opportunity in this moment in human history is to actually you know really um in a way protect our cells and our mitochondria from some of our you know norms in our environment um and give them slightly different inputs from what we consider normal. And, and in doing so, just free up the capacity of our cells and our mitochondria to do the work and create the energy that will give us a happy and healthy life. Um, and so that then, practically speaking, comes down to thinking about 
things like food and our sleep habits and our movement habits and our emotional health and our relationship with sunlight and artificial light, our relationship with toxins, our relationship with even temperature. And thinking about each of these sort of seven pillars of our environment and thinking about how do I you know, do the best within each of these pillars to basically support my cellular health. Um, and, and doing a lot of taking stock of like, which of these pillars am I kind of crushing on? And where could I, where could I, ha- where are ones where I really need to kind of like clean it up and focus on the ones where there's, um, you know, the most high leverage. But I give a lot of quizzes in my book with each of these different pillars to really look at your life and take honest stock of, you know, what are your norms and how is that affecting your mitochondrion cells? And then where can we, you know, where can we really lean in and, um, clean a few things up to really give ourselves more capacity to do this metabolic work. Absolutely. Well, when I look at clients that I'm working with, like if I were to take your book and these quizzes and your knowledge and and use it for a client, I would first start and say, yes, I know, Casey, the world is not great. Like artificial light, endocrine disrupting chemicals, like dyes and high fructose corn syrup in our food supply. Woe is me, right? But how do I know about my specific mitochondria first in comparison? Like, yes, the world is so harsh, but in reality, like my mitochondria might be working less optimally than Chris, my husband, his might be working better. How do we get a baseline of where our mitochondria is at at the beginning before we take these seven pillars, clean up our life and take stock again? I was like, to get that information first. So like, what are there key metabolic markers? What blood tests are we doing? Like, how do we know like my mitochondria are kicking butt or they're, <laughs> they're super gassed? Like, this is the best question because this is basically like, how do we start the whole journey by just taking stock of where we stand? And I think there's two key ways to stay, to take stock of where we stand. And one is using labs and technology, which is so exciting because we actually live in this amazing time in human history where we like have direct access to labs and biomarkers and it's amazing. But I'd say before any of that, step one is just to check in with how you feel. I think this gets so overlooked in our culture, which is that the body is constantly giving us signals about how well powered it is, how, 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 whether it's, getting its needs met or not. And that's symptoms, right? And like, I think that one of the issues with our busyness industrial complex, you know, this like this cult of busyness that we live in, that we've been basically, you know, sold, um, is that we are, and I can only speak for myself, like we don't have a lot of time to just sort of like sit quietly with our body and hear the signals that it is so desperately trying to tell us through our moods and through our symptoms. But really, those are our greatest teacher. I think something so fascinating about the, the culture that we live in is that we are we are implicitly, I don't even think we recognize this, we are implicitly petrified of symptoms. And if you look at like, what is the purpose of a CVS or Walgreens? They pay lip service to like generating health, but really the purpose of both of those businesses is to squash symptoms. You walk in and it's like, I've got reflux. Here's 50 different antacid medications. Oh, you've got knee pain or a headache or anything. Here's 50 different types of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Oh, you've got a rash. Here's a ton of topical cortisone. It's the whole purpose of those stores is to, to take your intolerable symptom and squash it because what's right is to have an absence of symptoms. And I think what is what we really can do to start understanding what our body needs is to actually sit with our symptoms and look at them as a gift and say like, what is my body desperately trying to tell me? And what it's probably trying to tell you, actually what it definitely is telling you is that it is not getting its cellular needs met because symptoms and diseases are a result of cells not functioning properly. They have to be, they don't arise in a vacuum. And so that's just step one, pre-biomarkers. It's like, creating the space in your life to hear what your body's telling you, respect it, honor it, thank it, and then try and hear what the underlying real need is. Is it, is it, and, and truly running through those pillars and, and what we talked about, is it, you know, taking stock? Okay. And I do this when I have a headache or like when I maybe get some acne, I'm like, okay, my body's talking to me. Like it's saying something's not quite right. And it's like, run the list. Like, how's my food been? How's my hydration been? How are my electrolytes been? How's my sleep been? You know, how has my stress levels been? Have I been meditating? Have I been breathing? 
Have I been going to therapy? Like, what have I been putting in and on my body? Alcohol? What other toxins? You know, have I been staring at my computer till two in the morning every night? And and once I go through that list, I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly yeah. what's going on. Yeah. So that's kind of that's kind of step one. <laughs> step two is the biomarkers, which I think we both love. But basically, there are five or six super basic, generally free biomarkers that can be essentially your check engine light on metabolism that usually your doctor will order for your physical, often covered by insurance. And these are basically what define metabolic syndromes. So we want to know every year, at least once a year, what is our fasting glucose? What is our fasting triglycerides? What are our HDL levels? What's our waist circumference? What's our blood pressure levels? What's our hemoglobin A1C? Mm -hmm. And if you look at research just from two years ago in the American College of Cardiology, if we had all these biomarkers and they were meeting certain ranges, they called this optimal metabolic health. And only 6.8% of Americans fell into that criteria. And so step one is just knowing where we stand. Are we in that 93%? Are we in that 7%? So to be in that 6.8%, What they wanted to see on those biomarkers was a fasting glucose less than 100, a triglyceride less than 150, HDL above 40 for men or 50 for women, waist circumference less than 35 inches for women or 40 inches for men, blood pressure less than 120 over 80, hemoglobin A1C less than 5.7%, and then also... um, a total cholesterol to HDL ratio of three of less than 3.5 to one. So essentially that with just basic, basic biomarkers all together, less than a hundred dollars, if you're paying out of pocket, you can start to see if you're falling into that more metabolically healthy range or part of the 93% that's not optimally metabolically healthy. So that's just step one is to make sure You've got those biomarkers. And each one tells us a little bit about what's going on with our mitochondria. You know, because if your mitochondria isn't doing so well and it can't process food energy to cellular energy well because it's hurt, what's going to happen? Well, the cell in its infinite wisdom will do things like blocking the entry of glucose into the cell. Glucose is one of those, you know, food energy substrates that we can convert to cellular energy. Well, if the mitochondria can't do it, the cell is going to be like, we don't want any more glucose coming into the cell. So it's going to create what's called insulin resistance. And that blocks glucose entry into the cell. So glucose will rise in the bloodstream. So that's why a fasting glucose test can give you a little, a little bit of a snapshot on what's actually going on inside the cell. Because it's a, it's an, a rising glucose is an effect of something actually happening deep in our metabolic processes. Similar with triglycerides. Triglycerides is a form of fat in the blood and body that is when we have excess glucose floating around the bloodstream and there's excess sugar, it can convert to this type of fat for storage. So that's why, again, looking at our fasting triglyceride levels can give us a little, if we squint a little bit, it can give us a snapshot of kind of what's happening actually inside the cell with the mitochondria. So all together, those tests kind of give us a little bit of a tea leaves about what's happening with our metabolism. Um, From there the sky's the limit on more testing to kind of get more richness and nuance in the metabolic picture. A few of my absolute favorite tests, which are going to be ones that you will need to ask your doctor for, because they're not probably going to be ordered just like standard on your physical, would be a fasting insulin test to, to take a real deep look at insulin resistance. I think fasting insulin is the most important test that we can all be getting because it can tell us about you know, basically how hard our body's working to try and drive glucose into the cells um, and insulin levels will go up as we become more metabolically dysfunctional. I love liver testing like AST and ALT to tell us how our liver, this key metabolic organ is doing. I love CRP, an inflammatory marker, because we know that inflammation goes up as metabolic dysfunction goes up. Uric acid is another fantastic metabolic marker. Um, And I'm a big fan of vitamin D as well, which is involved in so many different metabolic processes. And if it's low, it's something super actionable that we can kind of bring up. So right there, those are kind of the top maybe 15 I would order. Um, And then also I really like ApoB, which is of course going to tell us about how many sort of um, damaging cholesterol particles are kind of floating around our bloodstream. So 
that's kind of my like every six month basic picture for myself and certainly for anyone that I'm counseling on getting a snapshot of your metabolic health. Yeah, that's phenomenal. And I love how you tied together how glucose and insulin play like such a large role, whether that be your A1C, your fasting glucose, your fasting insulin, um, and even your triglyceride level. I think there's so many times when someone sees high triglycerides and they Google triglycerides and it says fat. And then I work with them and they say, well, I've been cutting fat out of my diet because my triglycerides are high. And I'm like, that is a snapshot of how many carbohydrates you've eaten for the last like three to five days, actually. (laughs) That tells me more about like that that macronutrient than fat at all. Like that is not, that's not what it's looking at. And that, that, that can be a disconnect for people. So knowing that what, what's the biggest lever that people can start to pull to give their mitochondria a break or to make them function more like efficiently? Oh my gosh. Well, with each of the pillars, it's like, oh my gosh, each one feels like so, you know, so important. It's all a tapestry, right? But I I have to say, like, I think it's unavoidable that we've got to get food right. Like food is just, I'm so in awe of food because our bodies are basically 100% molecularly made of food. I think about like, Pregnancy is basically like 3D printing a baby out of food. Like we are 100% food. And that's so cool. But it's also like, it's why we have to get it right. Um, So food, so food is 100% of what we're built of. It's also, you know, and it's not like that just happens one time. We are constantly rebuilding ourselves every single day. You know, I love this Taoist statement that the body, it's a process, not an entity. We think of the body in the Western world as like, this thing that's like a casey that lives and then dies. But what we, you know, really know from the biology is that like we're constantly just through the food we're eating, just rebuilding our cells and our tissues and our organs and excreting, you know, billions of dead cells per day in this constant hive of activity throughout our lifetime. So that's why food is so important because we're literally constantly giving the body the 3D printer ink to print the next version of ourselves which is the coolest opportunity because we can always rebuild a healthier version because we are a process. We are not a thing. So food, we got to get that right. On top of all of that, the fact that it's the bricks of our body, it's also the instruction manual for our body. These molecules in that 70 metric tons of food are going into the body and literally telling our genes how to be expressed, how our genes should be folded on our epigenetics, telling our microbiome literally what chemicals to produce, which then go into our bloodstream and control our metabolic health. You know, it's, it's, uh, cell signaling molecules. So it's, it's the building blocks and it's in the instructions. So because of all that, we have got to get it right. And, you know, if I had to just say it super simply that the easiest way to start getting it right is to move away from ultra processed foods that are made in factories and to move towards, um, whole unprocessed foods. And frankly, as much as we can get from things like the farmer's market as possible. And the reason for that is several fold. One is that the more unprocessed and whole our food is, and the closer it comes from the source, like the closer it was literally from picked from the ground, the more nutrient density the food is going to have. And if we think about those 70 metric tons of food as essentially, you know, the quality of that material is what will define our structure and our function. Um, then we want to load that 70 tons with as much nutrient information as possible for our body. But with processing, we immediately strip out a bunch of the molecules from that 70 metric tons. We immediately just dump a bunch of it out and literally throw it away. And the more our food is separated from the earth. So the average piece of food in America travels 1,500 miles from farm to our plate. And all that transit time, it's literally just losing nutrient density. And so the fresher the food we can get, the more unprocessed, it's essentially so much more bang for your bite. Um, and, and we're going to get more of that helpful information into the body. So that just means, and I think when it comes down to actually like what I do day to day, it's a lot of swaps. It's how do I swap ultra processed foods, the, you know, flour tortillas, the crackers, the pastas, the chips, the cookies for alternatives that are similar, but more whole food. So the flacker, 
for the wheat cracker, the Mm -hmm. almond flour tortilla for the processed wheat tortilla, the, um, you know, siete chip for the regular tortilla chip that's made with cassava flour instead of ultra processed white flour. It's the, the, the butter lettuce taco instead of the flour, you know, taco. So it's just thinking, you know, the, the konjac root pasta instead of the, the white pasta. So a lot of swaps basically to get more whole foods instead of ultra processed versions of, of the food. And, um, you know, I think when it comes to food, I tried to make it very simple in the book and really focused on how do we translate what we know about cellular biology into an eating plan that is non-dogmatic and totally overcomes the diet wars. And basically, we just focus on first principles. What do our cells and mitochondria molecularly need to do their best work? And when I really looked at the data, there were five things that I could be pretty clear on. And those five things that the the cells really need are fiber, omega-3 fats, healthy protein, a probiotic source, and antioxidants. And so when you really, and each one for a different reason supports our mitochondrial and cellular health. And so what's so cool about focusing on those five molecular components is that if we're vegan or keto, we can actually get all those things in because there are plant and animal-based sources of each. So eating becomes actually just making like a little mental list or a physical list on your fridge of like, what are your favorite foods in each of those categories? Stock your kitchen with them and then mix and match to make your meals. So for me, it's like my favorite probiotic sources is like sauerkraut, um, whole milk Greek yogurt, kvass, kimchi, miso. I've got all of those at the house. My favorite omega-3 sources, uh, mackerel, uh, salmon, hemp seeds, chia seeds, basil seeds, walnuts. My favorite healthy protein sources, grass-fed meats, egg, grass-fed poultry, um, fiber. I love chia seeds. I love flax seeds. I love beans. I love lentils. Um, so raspberries, avocado, those are two actually you know, high fiber plant foods. So have your favorites of each of these and then putting together a meal is like, okay, I'm going to grab a little antioxidant. I'm going to grab a little probiotic. I'm going to grab a little fiber. I'm going to have a little protein, grab a little omega-3. Boom, I've got my meal. And I think if we focus on components over dogma, it, it really frees us up to feel so much less limited in our eating journey and actually just so much more creative. So that that's pretty much my... That's my 360 on how I think about food. And I'm just, um, I come at food with a real sense of awe because it is this miraculous substrate from the environment that essentially has the power to unleash, you know, our our health and happiness um, if we can work with it in a really positive way. Well, I, I, it's like an echo chamber in here because I feel like light structure for me in the last decade, working with clients individually, not just saying like, this is how you should eat this to my community online. Like I see consistency, commitment, motivation when there is freedom and flexibility, but like bumpers on your bowling lane because people feel like they're knocking down pins, you know? And I love the addition of probiotics and the detail on the fat source being omega-3 in your 5N because those are so clear and so easy for people to find their favorites and plate up the good stuff and feel good being like, there's my antioxidant source or my greens. Like there's my healthy fat. There's my protein. Like I know what my cells need. I know what my body needs. I know what provides a good energy, pun intended, to my mitochondria, to my body so that I can perform at my best because it's when we get dogmatic. It's when we marry our lifestyle diet and preach about it that we can't really tune in and say like, how do I feel? Which is how you started this podcast. The people turning in, looking in and seeing like, what are my symptoms? Do I have brain fog? Do I have energy issues? Am I feeling positive about my life and my day? And and you're exactly right. That lever of food is the biggest one we can pull when it comes to creating good energy in our body. And and I love that those five components. Like I'm I am your megaphone today. Like that is, that is going to create so much health for people if they can commit to that simple, simple type of a plan. And I know you don't do a lot of like, pull this out of your life. This isn't great for you. But the reality is, is like, 
there are things that are breaking down and our mitochondria and creating metabolic dysfunction. And you highlight three in the book as uh, as the three to, to pull out whenever you can. And as a mom of little children thinking about their bodies, like continuing that I 3D printed three humans and that they are walking around in my house, running the place and like continuing to grow. I mean, it just blows my mind. I swear Bash grows like a foot at a time. And I'm like, what just happened? Like his body needs so much and he's spending so much energy being so active in his little life. Like I don't want to break down and hurt his mitochondria. But when you see that there are children with fatty liver disease, they have type two diabetes at six and seven years old. They have a waist circumference that is, is metabolically unhealthy. Like we need to know what those three things are to keep out of our kids plate and our family's lives. Like What are we keeping out of our plate to protect mitochondrial health? Yeah. There's just really three things that I recommend essentially eliminating from your life forever, starting today, if you haven't already, which is refined, ultra-processed added sugars, refined, ultra-processed grains, and industrially refined, ultra-processed seed oils. So added sugars, refined grains, and industrially processed seed oils. These are foods that in the form they're in today, like are basically like recent additions to the diet in the past very short period of time. And people might say, but we've been having, there's been bread for thousands of years, not the bread we have today, not the bread where the, you know, we have make, been making whole grain bread for, you know, millennia for sure, which includes the entire wheat kernel just crushed basically. But now through a science experiment, we figured out how to actually extract so much of the wheat kernel and just get the endosperm, this like starchy, rich, sticky part that just floods our body with carbohydrates. And that, so that right there is, that is what ultra processing is. Processing is like breaking something down, cooking it, smushing it. Ultra processing is when we take individual components through a science experiment pull them apart, and then repackage them back together in Franken foods. That's the step that makes it going from something our bodies are not confused by to something our bodies are petrified of and confused by. And so ultra-processed sugars, ultra-processed grains, and ultra-processed industrial seed oils now make up the vast majority of calories that we are eating in America today. And they are foods that don't do anything to help build the structure of the body, don't do anything to help with the function of the body, and gum up our molecular machinery to hurt our cellular biology and create dysfunction and disease. So, you know, I think it comes down to practically speaking, reading every single label. If you're buying food that is not in its whole natural form, which of course is okay. Like I have literally 12 bags of flackers sitting in my, in an Amazon box right now in my front hall, which of course were made in a factory, but they have three ingredients, organic flax seeds, organic apple cider vinegar, and sea salt. So that is, to me, I feel totally fine with that. But reading labels and looking for added sugars and really trying to keep that number very, very low, um, definitely less than I would say five grams per serving, but ideally zero. And looking for all the seed oils that we know are you know chemically extracted in factories, the corn oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, um, vegetable oil, canola oil, rapeseed oil, and then the refined ultra processed grains, which might look like enriched wheat flour, white flour, um, things like that. And if we can get rid of those three things, what happens is we basically end up moving away from ultra processed food. And that's what's great for us. So those are those are the unholy trinity that are causing, I mean, they're weapons of mass destruction, basically, for our health and our families. And, and we need to the science experiment has failed. Um, that that is super super clear. That that this invention of chemically modified foods, um, industrially modified foods, it is directly leading to disease and suffering. And I think we just all collectively need to say, like, we're done with this experiment and we're moving past it. And that was a fifty year blip that sucked. And we're going back to more natural food because, you know, we want to feel our best. A hundred percent. I think when I think about the example of, I always tell my clients to imagine rice dropping into like a cup of water and rice flour crackers dropping into a cup of water. And like, what does that slurry look like? I mean, it's not your stomach acid. It's not being broken down in that water, but the, it's amazing 
the fine degree to which these flowers are ground. It's nothing that you, there's no mastication or amount of chewing that would produce this refined type of a flower. And when you think about the contact that's being made with the epithelial lining, like, or dropping flour on your kitchen counter versus like grains on your kitchen counter, even like rice or oats versus oat flour or rice flour, like, or wheat, old traditional wheat. Like, what does it look like? How much ground is it actually covering? Because that's a speed at which that is passing through the epithelial lining and creating that surge in blood sugar. It is, it is as destructive as when you think about like liquid sugars, like juices or like high fructose corn syrup, like you can picture that, like, that contact being made. But when you really think about the flowers, I think we are bucketing, we can bucket carbohydrates being like so bad for us metabolically. But really when you break them apart from cellular and acellular carbohydrates, like is it wrapped in its fiber cell or is it obliterated by a machine out of it? Because it's it's that contact and that speed that causes so much work for our pancreas oh. and causes such destruction in our blood sugar balance. And you know this firsthand being a co-founder of Levels and I'm a huge fan of Levels. My community knows that. Like there, there is no um, financial swap here for any of this. Like I love Casey and all that she stands for and all that she does because when I get a client on Levels and they can see how their food choices are impacting their blood sugar, they can make choices to change. And it can be as simple without a continuous glucose monitor of someone eating your five in or the fab four or getting into a whole food space. But there's just, yeah, there's just, there's just a lot of our food supply that is, that is being delivered to us in a form that we could never chew to. So that just, that, that is like a huge aha for me. Yeah. Oh, I love you're such an incredible communicator. I think that it's like that those visuals that you just said are just, you know, you and I think about these concepts all day, every day. And it's even, it's, it blows my mind, you know, just thinking about that rice cracker in the water versus the rice or the, the way the surface area of like flour covering the gut lining. It's like, it, it's, it really hits home the point. Um, and I think solidifies this, this, yeah, this concept that so much of our symptoms and our diseases right now, I think are just, it's, basically biochemical confusion. Like our, our cells are just, they're both undernourished and overwhelmed Mm -hmm. and they are crying out. They are like, just like children who aren't getting their needs met, you know, because they need a snack or need a diaper change and they don't have the words to say it. And so they're just, they're, they're screaming out with these symptoms and dysfunction and just thinking about, yeah, from that standpoint of a cell, like getting this ultra processed white flour that's maybe packaged with like red 40 and high fructose corn syrup and an emulsifier. And it's like, what must the cell think? Like, what is going on? Like, what is this crazy world, bizarre world that we're living in? And it's way of essentially responding to that is saying, here's some acne, here's some headaches, you know, here's some menstrual irregularities, some hormone issues. Like it doesn't know what to do. And I think about that across all pillars of you know, that we've talked about, like you think about the light and it's like, well, we've evolved for millennia to like see, you know, the light bulb was invented in 1806. It's, it's like a, it's like a 0.04% of human history. We've had artificial light Mm -hmm. and it's a blip. It's a blip. And we just think it's so normal. Right. But it's not in terms of the human body. And so you've got this cell that is diurnal. It's supposed to do certain activities during daylight and other activities during darkness. And the way that cell knows what time it is and what to do is by whether there's photon energy coming from the sun or not. And now we don't go outside during the day. We're inside 93% of the time as Americans. And we have artificial light blasting into our eyes at night when it's supposed to be the absence of light energy. So our cells, again, how confusing for them. They don't know what is going on. So I just love I just love thinking about my body that way. Like just these poor, helpless cells that don't have words to communicate with me. And it is my job as the self, as the human to take care of them. And so what can I do to basically like help them get some footing in this world that we're living in um, and not just like confuse the crap out of them with the food and the, and the, you know, the toxins and the, and the light and the, 
the chronic stress coming in through social media and all of it. So how do we just like create a, a little bit more of a stable world for them of what they're expecting? Yeah. I'm, I'm laughing a little bit now because we set up the podcast studio to be in person and we're working on building this and I am surrounded by like four or five, like just like light panels shining Me too. Face <laughs> right now. Um, and, but I want to dissect that a little bit because Whenever I'm on vacation, whenever I'm camping, whenever I'm, you know, I I will say having an office has helped me because I work here and I work hard. And then the phone goes in my my purse. And the other day, like I had finished bedtime and I was like, have you seen my phone? And Chris was like, no. And I found it in my purse, in the mudroom, like literally from like four o'clock when I got home until like nine o'clock at night, I had no idea where it was. And that was like, Oh my gosh, thank goodness I got an office because now I have these boundaries and I have these abilities, these places where like it is appropriate and it's no longer appropriate, especially with, you know, like people like Jonathan Haight being like, this is the anxious generation. Well, yeah, we're super stressed out. We're on our phone all the time. These young children don't need to be around that. Um, So I was like really excited that I lost my phone. (laughs) That's amazing. Really good feeling um, because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, I had a Razor flip phone and, or maybe a little longer than that. Maybe it was a Blackberry then. But like in college, I had a Razor flip phone that I'd get text messages, but it was like, you'd call people, you'd talk to them. You weren't constantly staring at a screen. Like knowing that we are in the technological era, like what are best practices for making sure that we are protecting ourselves from artificial? Mm. What are you doing? Like realistically, like there, you have a big business, your co-founder, mm-hmm. you just wrote this book. You're on your book tour. Like you communicate with friends. Like it, it, You get emails, there's social media. Like, how do you have boundaries? What are you doing? Oh my gosh. Great questions. Yeah. So I think on the on the highest level, it's like knowing what what our cells really need based on what the research tells us. And I think when I think about it across the pillars, it's like our cells need real food full of nutrients. Our cells need consistency, quality, and quantity of sleep around seven to eight and a half hours, probably for the average person of good quality sleep with consistent bedtimes and wake times. We, our cells need to be moving throughout the whole day, not just in a one hour exercise. They need to be moving throughout the day regularly because that keeps our glucose channels of the cell membrane. And we want to, of course, build muscle and get our heart rate up. So that's more the exercise, but also the cells need to be in motion throughout the day. Uh, Our cells need to feel a sense of safety psychologically. We need to regardless of what's happening outside of our body, inside our body, it needs to generally feel safe most of the time with maybe some acute moments of stress, but the vast majority of the time, safety. We need to have absence of toxins that can hurt our hormones and our mitochondria. We need to see sunlight during the day and we need to see darkness when the sun has gone down. And we ideally need to be exposed to different temperatures because throughout basically all of human history, we've had big swings in temperatures. I mean, we didn't have indoor heating and cooling until the last hundred years, like like true centralized heating and air. So that's a thermal neutrality is a totally new environment. So step one is just like, based on the science, what do our cells actually need to function properly? And that right there was like a short list of just like, that's an unemotional. That's just like, I'm just talking about biologic signals. So then the question becomes, how do we We're not going to go back to an agrarian society where we're moving around outdoors all day. So how do we take the modern world that we're living in and our individual lives, the things that we do every day that we want to do, that we might need to do, um, and essentially take stock of what we're doing each day across food, emotional health, sleep, movement, and build in those inputs that I just mentioned that the cells really need into our modern knowledge worker lives. And so it's a lot of taking honest stock of what does your day look like and how can I incorporate small changes throughout the whole day, essentially small changes to give the cells more of what they actually need. So for me, you know, I think this is really what I've done to sort of build my life now, which is, okay, so I am doing a book tour and I do have, you know, I'm working at a company and I, there's a lot of time that I need to spend on my computer but I, I need to be moving and I need to be outdoors and I need to see sunlight. So 
right now I'm in my office, but there's a sliding glass door right here. And I literally got this house because it has a sunny backyard and I have a standing desk in the backyard, which is basically an old table, sit to stand table that I had that's broken. That's now always at the standing height and it gets rained on and whatever. It's not electrical. It's just a tall table basically. And I spend most of my time working either outdoors at that standing table or at my desk in my office with the with the glass doors open. And I use a walking pad, which is $120 on Amazon. And in two and a half hours, I can get my 10,000 steps, you know? And so it's like, I try to start every day at my standing desk or walking on my treadmill desk. And then when I get tired, I sit down for a little bit. But like, I create environments in my home that make it easier for me to do my computer work, either standing, moving, or in the sunlight. And that has been incre- that has definitely helped my health and my mood and my sense of depletion at the end of the day. Cause like, you know how it is. It's like being outdoors, it's just so like spiritually repleting. So I still do spend time sitting at the desk, mostly for podcasts, but I make sure that I've got environments to do other things. Um, in terms of the computer stuff, you know, I mean, I have an incredible um, executive assistant through a company called Athena, which is like an amazing startup that helps pair you with an executive assistant and wonderful group of people in the Philippines. And, you know, Nina, who's my assistant, who's just like my God, you know, a godsend, she is really like first line for me on all social media platforms. And so creating a space between me and the constant influx of communication that's coming in is really important for me and my my mental health. And it's very affordable program. And um, so I get basically like a filtered view of what could be hundreds of messages from just... you know When you think about the modern world, even for anyone between Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, TikTok, email... You could be getting literally thousands of messages a day, like even just no no matter you know whether you have a following or not. And so having some sort of ability to create a space between me and all of that is really important for my for my mental health, um, so that I can focus on the signal rather than kind of all the noise. That's one other example. Um, and then I love to find activities that literally require me to not have my phone, like no screen, like it's not possible to have a screen. So things like stand up paddle boarding, um, a lot of water activities, you know, and um, if I go on a hike, I'll leave my phone at home. I love backpacking for that reason and just going away for a few days where you cannot, literally cannot get text message or email. So I think that's one of the things we need to do in the modern world is actually just like find activities that force us to not be with screens because otherwise it's just the default. Um, and And then just, you know, I think... The other thing is just cultivating community around people who like to do sort of similar things to you, you know, like, hey, instead of going out to eat, let's meet at the farmer's market, you know, let's meet for a meditation class, let's, um, let's go for a hike, like, let's just, you know, um, can we can we meet up for a walk, um, you know, on the beach instead of meeting up for coffee and sitting and things like that. So just kind of always suggesting activities if I have a choice in the matter that are going to be promoting cellular health rather than, um, you know, kind of default to sitting indoors, eating processed food or on a screen, which is so much of what the default is. So those are kind of a few things that I do. But I think broadly speaking, I think of almost everything I do, how I design my home, how I choose to spend my leisure time, how I set up my office as how do I do as much as I possibly can to support cellular and mitochondrial health and move as many of my indoor seated activities to outdoor moving activities as possible while still getting what I need to get done during the day for the work that brings me lots of joy, which is obviously, you know, the metabolic health work. So many things just came out of that for me. And and one of the keys would be like creating boundaries between yourself and the things that stress you out and or put you on your phone or your computer when it's not necessary. It's almost like, why are we having a Zoom meeting if it could be an email? Why are you in your DM if you could have someone supporting you to, to do that? Because there, people really do have access to whoever is online if they are not private. Like they have access to you and that is more time with you on your phone. I think for me, that was a lesson that I learned late. Like I didn't get help. I didn't ask for help. I was constantly the person responding to everything, owning my social media channels. 
And then it, then you're being responsive instead of proactive around what you're here for, which is Mm -hmm. to live a full life, to give back, to have purpose, which, you know, is so clear for you, for me, for you, like your good energy comes through and your mission comes through, through levels, through this book, through the memory of your mom, which I'd like to speak to it. We close out this podcast. Um, but but also not only to do that, but to set your life up for success. I think we all are going to default to wanting to sit on the couch and watch a funny Netflix show and like be sedentary. Like, how do you set yourself up for a little more discomfort and get it to a place where it becomes a habit or you're the one spearheading change, like a walk with friends versus sitting in a restaurant. So thank you for giving us all of your good energy and for coming with your purpose. Like I can, I've known you for so long. I feel your purpose. I know you're here to make change and, and you're doing that. Um, I think your mom would be really, really proud of you. And I know your dad is. So (laughs) when, when you think about, you know, what you've been through, I'd love for you to share like the deeper meaning behind your purpose and why you're here, because it for me is, is motivation for so many people who go through trauma and lose yeah. people they love. Like, how is your mom's memory and what you went through, like, what drives you to share your purpose with all of us? Mm. Well, thank you, Kelly. It's beautiful words. And I mean, I received that so deeply. Thank you. Um, you know, so for me, such a big motivator on top of all my personal experience in healthcare comes from this experience I had with my mom you know, who I think unfortunately had a path, like an almost like archetypal path that so many American people are dealing with today, which is that she was a faithful engager with the healthcare system and a believer in the healthcare system and tried so hard to be a good patient. And, you know, ultimately you know, she racked up the chronic illnesses. She took the pills the doctors told her to pill, to take. She went to all the specialist visits and she ultimately got a lethal diagnosis, pancreatic cancer, and died very quickly and very prematurely at about 72. And, you know, when I look at my mom's story, which she's very much a through line through good energy, she was really the epitome of good energy, just like such, such a joyful person. But, you know, she, it kind of started... Um, so, so early in her life when she was, had me in her late thirties, I was like an almost 12 pound baby. I was, you know, fetal macrosomia, literally like a, a, a extra large baby, which we know portends metabolic issues for the child, which I ended up developing as a child and for the mother. Then she had a really tough menopause with really bad, you know, vasomotor symptoms and sleep issues. Then in her 60s, she developed the high cholesterol and the high blood pressure and the high blood sugar. And she went to all, you know, the cardiologist and the endocrinologist and, you know, all the things. And then, you know, in her early 70s, she got this cancer diagnosis. And between her diagnosis and her death was only two weeks. She literally had stomach pain, got a CT scan, and then was gone two weeks later. And the part that, you know, I think is so upsetting is that, you know, she was seeing what people would call the quote unquote best doctors in the country at the time of her death. She had had gotten Mayo executive physicals and she was being seen at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, which is associated with Stanford. And she was faithfully doing everything the system told her to do. Never missed an appointment, never missed a checkup, screening, et cetera. And when the doctors talked to us, the oncologists, they said, oh my gosh, this is just so unlucky. We're so sorry. And I just thought, you know, this is such BS. Like, this is not unlucky. It's unlucky if we have our conventional medicine goggles on, where we look at every disease as a different collection of symptoms. Sure, of course, then pancreatic cancer looks very different than bad menopausal symptoms or a large baby. But if you actually put on your systems biology, network biology, metabolic health, root cause physiology, functional medicine, whatever you want to call them, goggles, Mm -hmm looking at connections, what you see is that the cellular physiology that actually led to me being a big baby, which was probably driven by insulin resistance, that's what drives fetal macrosomia, is the same physiology that drives high blood pressure and high blood sugar and even bad menopausal symptoms and cancer. So mm-hmm. it's not unlucky. And I think it that infuriates me because, you know, and I, I mean, I have compassion for the doctors because obviously this is how they're trained, but we need an update to the system because too many people 
are suffering and are dealing with premature loss of their parents to lethal diseases or even to neurodegenerative diseases, losing their, you know, unfortunately their, their, their mind and spirit too early. And so, um, we need to reimagine what the future of healthcare looks like based on root causes. And I think my mother, unfortunately, is just so emblematic of, of the cost of missing the warning signs and the cost of practicing in a way that does not really look at our true nature as humans as fully connected systems where there's... You know, and I think I would say that the message, I would, you know, that... that bigger than the metabolic health, bigger than the cellular energy, bigger than chronic disease epidemic. The real message of this book and of good energy is about connection because it's the disconnection that's built into every aspect of our healthcare system that is killing us and that will not work for the future of the planet or humanity because it's an illusion that we've created. It's disconnection. We, we basically say that all these diseases are disconnected. They're not related. They're separate things. They need to be seen in a hundred different specialist offices. We have over a hundred specialties. We say things like, you know, a calorie is a calorie and it doesn't really matter what calorie it is. It's just put it in your body. You're going to use it for energy. Not seeing the connection, the interdependent connection between us and soil and water and sunlight and air and animals and plants in a totally connected interdependent ecosystem that is constantly in conversation with itself. We don't even have curiosity between, you know, this connection between our lives and you know, death and sort of recreation in this endless cycle. Like you think about the Western view of the body, like I said earlier, it's like we're a human and we live and we die. And in so many Eastern or indigenous, you know, cultures, there's so much more, even stoicism, like there's this obsession with like reflecting on actually the beautiful cyclical nature of the body in this constant, you know, eternal, almost like cycle of life. And we, so on every level, every level in our Western healthcare system, everything's predicated on disconnection. And I really believe that true healing is about connection. And it's about a connection on every level between people in loving in-person relationships, in person. Yeah. It's, you know, in meditating on the connection between life and death and an endless eternal cycle, meditating on the connection between us and everything else in the environment, food, water, air, soil, bacteria, animals, plants, sunlight, you know, and how how we're actually all the same. So we need to respect all of that. And then of course, connection between all the diseases that we're facing today. And if we don't wake up to that, like, I think we're pretty screwed. <laughs> but I think it's, I think people, I think people, what I see is that people know that something's not quite right in where we're going as a species right now. And I think people want more like good energy on a philosophical level, on a real level in their lives. And so the work you're doing and you know, so many amazing trailblazers in this space. And hopefully with this book, the idea is to help give people a real something to hold on to, to kind of move towards that vision that I think is totally possible, but we've kind of got to do things a little differently. Okay. So you're so inspiring and you're so, you come with so much heart. And what I love about your message is that what feels really overwhelming to think about all of these specialists that your mom went to and all the diagnoses that she had along the way leading up is you distill down the information and you simplify it for so many other women and men whose parents are aging, who may have signs of what your mom went through when they were young, whether that's you know gestational diabetes or PCOS and going like, wait, light bulb, like light bulb, like something is wrong on a cellular level, not in a silo for my gastro, in a silo for my neurologist, at a silo of my gyno, like what is happening to me on a cellular level and, and how am I able to show up better for my parents and for the next generation? And your work is so, so, so important. And to continue to share this message and how it can be as simple as focusing on five things you're adding to your plate, getting those processed foods out of your life and, and starting to make the connections that your doctors aren't making for you so that other people don't have to lose their mom in the way that you did and that they can help their parents. You've found the silver lining and you've exploded it into a star. And I just want to thank you for your hard work and remember your mom in this moment for this podcast. Thank you. That means so much to me. I'm sending you so much love, Kelly. Thank you. That's so beautiful. And I'm so grateful for the work that you do to spread this message to such 
huge amounts of people every day. It's just, it gives me so much hope and joy. So I so appreciate you. We're going to get this book into everyone's hands. You guys, the the book is Good Energy by Dr. Casey Means and her brother. Um, And it is available now. Go pre-order. Make sure that you check out the show notes. um, Learn more about Casey. I'll also link her first episode to the show. Casey, where can people follow along? Where can they buy the book? The best place to follow everything I'm doing is caseymeans.com. That's my website. Links to all my social media handles. I'm on Dr. I'm at Dr. Casey's Kitchen on Instagram, um, but I'm on all other channels too. And there's links on my website. Um, I have a weekly newsletter which is called Good Energy Living, and that sort of shares tons of info about health um, and life. Uh, and then the book is basically just everywhere books are sold: Barnes and Noble, Amazon, small bookstores. So. Um, can't wait to hear everyone's thoughts uh, on the book. They're going to be amazing thoughts because it's an oh. amazing book. Thank you for early access. You guys, this is one that you don't want to miss. So thanks for being here, Casey. Thanks, Kelly. 